Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to First United Methodist Church, where we are striving to show God's love to all people, regardless of where they are in life's journey. And whether you're joining us online today or in person, or whether you're a regular attender or you're new today, we are glad you're here and we are excited to worship together today. A couple reminders. We like to, we have a moment during our service today where we share our praises and our prayers together. If you have a praise or a prayer you'd like to share, you can use the number on the screen, or you can use the cards in your pews to share that. And if it's a prayer request that you don't want me to read out loud today, but you would like passed along to our prayer chain, just mark it as confidential, and I'll pass that along. And then our announcements are in our bulletin. We have some very important ones about GraceWorks and an online safety class. Uh, please check on those, mark your calendars, and be sure to keep up with what's happening. And with that, I invite us to stand as we're comfortable and able, and we'll begin with our opening hymn, Come Christians Join to Sing. Our opening prayer this morning is a one and all. How shall we live when we have more than enough? We have no greater praise to offer than caring for your creation. Let us worship God, the ground of all being, living word whose love abides in us. You call us to love in truth and action. Give courage to our hearts so that we may love your beloveds. Open our ears to the wisdom of those you send who might otherwise be dismissed. Transform our charity into justice over all the world. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you. Let us pass the peace of Christ with one another.
Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 John 3, verses 16 to 24. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If your hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he is in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the Spirit he gave us.
Beautiful. Let us pray. Gracious God, first and foremost, we thank you and worship you and love you. And we thank you for uh, Jesus for coming into this world and becoming flesh and dwelling among us and loving us so much that you went all the way to Calvary. And we ask, Lord, today that you would bless this time together and that you would bless my words, that they would be pleasing to you and that you would open our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Picture it in your mind's eye, the cross. Not a pretty gold cross or a silver cross or a cross that is in, 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 has many jewels and pretty things on it, but an ugly cross, the cross of Calvary. You see, that is the, the reality of what, Jesus, or what, what the, first writer, the writer of 1 John speaks to us today, that how do we know that God loves us? We know because Jesus laid down his life for us. And it was not a pretty thing. You see, on that cross, Jesus hung with nails in his feet and nails in his wrist. And every time he needed to breathe, he would have had to push up with his ankles, take in a deep breath, and then exhale. And, and, and when he exhaled, it would have released, and all of the pain would have went through his body. And even more horrific, the view that he had from the cross as he looked out over the people and, and saw not only people who supported him and loved him, like his mother and Mary, Mar Mary Magdalene and John, but also the very people who put him on the cross, maybe the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the people who put him there, who turned him over to the authorities, those who scourged him, those who put the crown of thorns on his head, and those who mocked him. If you're the Son of God, then come down from there. Surely you can do it. That's the image that Jesus had from the cross. And yet his words were merciful. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. You see, his response to the rejection, the pain, the sorrow that had been inflicted upon him was graciousness and mercy and ultimately an act of love. The writer of 1 John goes on to say that if Jesus laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for one another. And then he says, you know, if you have means and you see somebody in need and you do nothing about it, well, is the love of God in you? Love one another. And the reality of, uh, of, of what Jesus tells us, really, he gives us an image of, of, of following him that's not easy. It's a difficult walk. Because it means loving in a sacrificial way. And it's not about how I feel about other people. It's not whether or not I like you or don't like you or you like me or don't like me. We have emotional connection. I mean, we think about love. We think about all of the feelings that are associated with love. I love you because I feel good about you. I love you because you like me and love me in return. I love you because you agree with me. But that isn't the kind of love that Jesus calls us to. And in fact, Jesus calls us to love our neighbors. Now, the other aspect of this idea of God loving us, you know, when I was growing up, there was a great emphasis on uh, my sinful reality and how bad I was as a person. And I'm not negating sin, by the way. Um, we all know that sin is real, and when we don't love neighbor as self, and we do harm to um, the people around us, and we don't know, do what we're supposed to do, that is absolutely a rejection of God. But when God looks at us, God sees the image of God in us. It doesn't matter who we are or how good or bad we are. In Genesis, it says that we are created in the image of God. Male and female, they are created in the image of God. That means that in every human being, no matter how good or bad, somewhere inside is that perfect image of God. And therefore, when God looks at us, God sees an image of God's self in each of us. And God loves us. 
You know, I, I was thinking about this, and, I, and in the earlier service I used some examples, uh, you know, that the image of God is very evident in humanity. It's not just in how we look. But there's a thing that separates us from all other creation. Now, all creation is good. God loves all of God's creation. But when you look at human beings, there's something different about human beings. Um, I, I used the example in the first service of a robin. Um, if you go and find a robin's nest here in Carson City and you can find them, or if you go to Ohio where I was born and you find a robin's nest, or you go to California where I landed for a while, you will find that every robin's nest looks like every other robin's nest. Millions of years of evolution have designed this robin that has a certain way of doing things. And I'm not saying that robins are completely unintelligent, but you're never going to see a robin's nest that's made into a four-bedroom, uh, three-bath home. It's always going to be the same robin's nest. But humans are different. The divine spark or the divine image of God, it, 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 it imposes itself or comes out of us in such a way that we are creative beings. We are creators like God. And when you see what humans can fathom, well, it's easy to get hung up on all the negative stuff, but there's some amazing things that people can do. Um, I remember when, uh, when, I, when I lived in the Bay Area and we would go to San Francisco and I would walk through the business district in San Francisco with all these high-rise buildings all around me. And one, and one day we were walking with friends from Ohio and it dawned on me, you know, the San Andreas Fault goes right through this city. It's a city that is prone to shaking. And it has a history. If you go back to 1906 or even before that, there was a series of earthquakes. But in 1906, an earthquake hit that just leveled the city. And what wasn't destroyed by the earthquake was destroyed by fire. But then in 1989, an earthquake not quite as severe as 1906 hit that same city with all of these skyscrapers that have been designed by people with, with creative minds. And although there certainly were buildings that were destroyed in San Francisco, most of them were down by the marina where you had fill from the 1906 and they created land and it was very unstable, so houses came down. But let me tell you, there was nary a, a, nary a skyscraper that had a broken glass in the 1989 earthquake. That's the image of God, the ability to create and to do things that are amazing. All of us have that image. But unfortunately, we tend to not see the image in others. And actually, if somebody we don't like, or somebody that's on the other side, I mean, in this day and age of polarization in this country, I see it every day. If you don't agree with me, I hate you. If you don't agree with me, well, you are going straight to hell. We don't see the image of God in our neighbors because we think our neighbors are only the people we choose to like. But the reality is we don't get to choose our neighbors. How many people here interviewed all the people around you before you moved into your house? How many people wish they had? <laughs> I remember when we first moved to Nevada, we had, the parsonage wasn't going to be ready for a while, so we leased a house that was actually under construction. And it was supposed to be done in mid-July, and we were moving here at the end of June, and initially we were going to stay with some, some of the parishioners here in the church who were lovely and kind and invited us. But then it turned out that this house was not going to be done until the end of August. That's a long time to stay in someone's house. And so we had another lovely parishioner who was a part of this congregation who owned a, um, an older um, uh, condo, or not condo, townhouse, and it was in a community, so it was like an apartment complex, which I had never lived in before, to be honest. And it was just love. It was met all of our needs. She was, it was great. It had three bedrooms, three baths, or two baths, and kitchen, and living room, and a garage, and a patio area out front. It was really great. It met our needs. And it was awesome. Except for one little fly in the ointment, our neighbors. From the very first, no, not the first day, it was about the third day when we met the neighbor next door. And it was actually kind of like you run into someone, right? And this person made it very clear from the very first moment she didn't like us. We didn't know why. 
We hadn't even had a conversation with this person. We didn't have any clue why this person didn't like us. But it was evident, and from that moment on, game was on. I mean, every day, we, you, you, you go out to the front patio, which was the one outdoor space, and whenever we'd go out there, we could hear them talking about us on the other side. It was very uncomfortable. And then there was... And that's only the tip of the iceberg. There was a neighbor across the way who we were friends with them, and he, he made it clear he didn't like us. Again, we had never had a conversation with any of these folks. And they would, he would sit in his garage with the door open and invite friends over, and whenever we came outside, or whenever I walked by, he had a very loud, booming voice. And he would say very derogatory things. And he would use um, words, racial slurs and homophobic slurs and all these things. And it would loudly, like every time. And it got to the point where going outside was so uncomfortable. And it took me a couple weeks. And then it dawned on me. Because I go, what have we done? Never even had a conversation. And then it dawned on me one day we had California license plates. That was enough. <laughs> Made all of his judgments about us, um, and, um, and game was on. Well, all of that went on, and I I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'm a human being like everyone else, and there were times I wanted to go over and just tell these people off, right? But I had to live there, and I really feel the Holy Spirit was really um, helping me to be calm. And we did have opportunities to be kind, um, especially to their kids. The neighbors right beside us had a little boy. He was like three years old. And we were able to show kindness to him, which was great. About a week before we moved out of that complex, um, the guy across the way who had never had a conversation with me but had said a lot of awful things came to visit the neighbors next door, and we happened to converge. Well, this was my moment, right? I can tell this guy what I think. I felt God just be calm. And I said, hello. And we started having a conversation. And first conversation the whole time we lived there. And he started asking me some questions. And I started asking him some questions and talking. And although I don't know that I changed his mind about anything, I do feel like God was in the moment. And God was loving this guy through me. I didn't like the guy. I still didn't like the guy. I'll be honest with you. You see, that's the problem. We mistake love for feelings. I like you. I love you. I feel good about you. But the kind of love that Jesus shows us on the cross is not, has nothing to do with feelings. It has everything to do with how we treat one another. And that's difficult. Because let's face it, who wants to treat the guy next door who has not said a kind word to you since you moved in and who said lots of bad words to you, who wants to treat that person with kindness or do what's right towards them? I sure as heck didn't. But following Jesus means that we do what we are supposed to do and not necessarily what we feel like doing. Doing what's right towards the other. Now, we're going to slip up. I can assure you that at some point in my life, I'm going, I have already many times reacted in the wrong way and, and felt really bad about my reaction. Um, I remember serving in, uh, in Antioch, California, and we had a real problem during 2020. Um, the property was overwhelmed because the church shut down, and we were kind of isolated, and the city was all around us, but we were kind of isolated. And um, we had a whole series. We always had homeless folks, but we had drug dealers come on the property. And so a whole other group of people were coming on who were not just there to sleep or eat or looking for help, but were kind of drugged out of their minds. And they started smashing our windows. Um, our youth building was just destroyed. Um, police were there every single week. They bl busted windows out in the sanctuary. There was trash and needles everywhere. And it was overwhelming because in some ways, as the pastor, because we were shut down, there was only a few people who were coming there. And I was taking the brunt of that. And I remember there was a homeless gentleman. Um, really intriguing kind of guy, actually. Very intelligent like, I could have conversations with him, and very tall. Like, he was 6'6". Six, six. He would walk around town. He would wear a sarong around his waist. And sometimes he would carry a plastic sword, and sometimes he would carry an umbrella all around town. And he made his way to our property. Very intelligent, but there was some stuff going on there. I would talk about Jesus, and he'd talk about aliens. It was just really interesting. But he would go through our dumpster every week. 
dump everything everywhere. And of course, I'm the one, me and a few trustees were over there trying to clean up. And I remember one day I showed up and I caught him in the act. And I had told him, I don't know how many times, please don't do this. And on that particular day, I did not love this gentleman. And I reacted and I screamed at him and I told him, get off our property. Conviction of the Holy Spirit came upon me. And, um, and it wasn't right away, but the next day I found him again. I went over and I said, please forgive me. I should not have spoken to you like that. Does that mean what he was doing was right? Absolutely not. But it means that my reaction to him was wrong. Our actions matter. Now, forgiveness, mercy. God is forgiving. Um, we can bring everything to Jesus. So when we mess up, like I messed up with that homeless guy, I, am, I, I immediately said, Jesus, please forgive me and help me to make this right. And I was able to make it right with that gentleman. Sometimes you won't be able to make it right. But at least your intent is, forgive me and help me to do what's right. You don't get to pick your neighbors. Um, Jesus told a story about the Good Samaritan. Um, and I want to tell you, the Good Samaritan is not the story of two people who loved each other or liked each other. It's two people, the Jews and the Samaritans, who hated each other. They didn't agree ideologically. They didn't agree on religion. They thought the other was the worst person in the world. And Jesus told this story. Now, you're going to hear this story, which it was rewritten by my lay leader at Antioch when I asked him to create something that is modern, that is still the story that Jesus told. And so here are these words. But wanting to justify ourselves, we ask, who is my neighbor? And Jesus replies with a story. A man was attacked by robbers on a lonely road. They took all his belongings and left him bleeding, naked, and dying. And then you came along. But you had to pick up the kids at soccer practice. That big project at work was hanging over your head. You had to get dinner on the stove. You were late for Bible study. Besides, you weren't trained to deal with things like this. You didn't have the resources. Others were much better equipped. So you pretended you hadn't seen the man and continued on your way. Soon, the hectic pace of the day pushed him from your mind. And then, along came someone else. Like you, but more. More educated, more wealthy beyond your imagination, more respected, better looking, all the time in the world. But this person, this best person of you, buried their nose in their phone and refused to even make eye contact with the man. But then, along came a black teenager in a dark hoodie with sagging pants. Along came two women holding hands. Along came a telemarketer. Along came a barefoot man pushing a shopping cart piled high with aluminum cans and soda bottles. Along came a woman in a hijab. Along came a middle-aged white man in a red trucker's cap. Along came a person wearing a t-shirt emblazoned with a flag striped with pink, blue, and white. Along came an indigenous millennial venturing off his reservation for the first time. Along came an elderly Asian man. Along came an undocumented immigrant. Along came a Republican. Along came a Democrat. An Israeli, a Palestinian, a Catholic, a Mormon, a Jew, an atheist, a Russian hacker, an addict, an ex-con. And it was this person who saw the beaten man, took pity on him, bandaged his wounds, took care of him. Now, tell me, who was the neighbor to this beaten man. We lower our gaze. The one who helped him, we mumble. Jesus smiles, but in his eyes there's a deep sadness. Go, he says, and do likewise. Amen.
Please stand for our closing hymn. The choir is going to sing through the first line or the first stanza because they don't think we um, know this song, and then we'll join with them. Also, this one we know, right? Yeah. Okay. I forgot we're, we're all still in flux. You may be seated. <laughs> yeah, don't go home yet, please. Yeah. <laughs> so. I guess we do. Never mind. <laughs> it's been a difficult three weeks. And now you may be seated. <laughs> In this transition to two services, I think they're all starting to meld together. So I'm um, at this time. Oh, no, it's your turn. <laughs> all right. We'll move to our time of praises and prayers today. Uh, first, a praise for all our friends online, particularly those who have been saying hello today. It's all of our, our usuals, my mom, the Newmans, the Deckers, Lisbeth, but the Sueys said hi from their cruise ship. So I guess they get bonus points today for coming to church while they're... And our friend Sabrina said hi from Germany. So the, she's, she's up at 8, 10, it's 8 o'clock there, and she's here at church with us. So welcome and thank you. It's always nice to know you're out there. And for that, we say, praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Sable Shaw, another one of our friends online right now, called to report that she is recovering well from her heart attack earlier in the year and sends thanks to everyone for their prayers. Praise, praise the Lord. Our friends, the Tiptons, Kathy and Bruce, who moved to uh, northern, uh, far, like in Elko a few years ago, have moved to Arco, Idaho, and Thursday, April 26th, will be Bruce's 60th birthday. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Lisbeth sends praises for God for a beautiful day. Amen and praise the Lord. Lisa Ray sends praises for her friend Eric for being able to find a good job in L.A. Eric is an ex-offender and a brother, and we know that sometimes it's hard for folks in that situation to find employment. So for that, we say, praise the Lord. And then, Pam, I had this in prayers, but I'll put it over here in praises. Roy and Pam, um, Eric Billings was in a mountain bike accident at the end of this, at the end of this week. Um, and suffered a broken hand and concussion and scrapes and bruises. But Pam says, even though our grandson still needs prayers from his crash, and which resulted in a hand, concussion, trauma to his lungs as well, we want to send a praise out to God and thank everyone for their prayers. And he did make it to the senior prom last night. 
That's a big investment. You know? <laughs> praise the Lord. Okay, I think I hit all of our praises today. So we'll move to our prayers today, which we'll respond to with amen. Carla, we pray for Carla Mosley's friend, Virginia Arnold, who's having surgery tomorrow. Prayers for everything to go smoothly and that a rapid recovery follows afterward. Amen. We pray for Brenda Frank, who has an upper respiratory tract infection. Amen. We pray for Brenda Lieber's brother, who's been diagnosed with early stage colon cancer. Amen. Um, ask for prayers for my friend Lori and the Youth First Tea for Teens fundraiser that's coming this Saturday. Prayers for myself preparing a tea for 120 people, for the teens who are speaking, and for generous donors. Amen. And we ask for God's ongoing healing and strength for Helmut Bantz, Joan Zadney, Tobin Volberding, Bob and Sandy Gagnier, Joyce Jalous, Yoni Sellers, Betty Holmes, Sable Shaw, Roy Hawley, the Newman's friends Jane and Bobby, and Lori Bird Mitchell. And we'll invite Pastor to come pray over our needs. You know why everything just went wrong? Because Jess and I, after last week's service, said, we did it perfectly. <laughs> we jinxed it. Oh, there you go. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we worship you and praise you today. And we do thank you for all of the answered prayers. We rejoice with all of those who are rejoicing. We, uh, we just thank you for all of those who lifted up their joys and their blessings so that we can hear what God is doing amongst us and with us and through us. Um, we also recognize that we live in a, in a world where there are many um, struggles, and especially even within our church, our community, um, we pray for all of those, those concerns that were lifted up. We pray for those who are fighting disease and cancer, that you would give them peace in the fight and the struggle, and that you would heal their bodies and their minds and their hearts. We pray for those who are mourning loss today, that you would bring comfort and hope and peace. We pray, God, that, um, that you would just answer all of the prayers that we've lifted up and also those that we have not spoken that we all have things in our hearts and our minds that maybe we haven't lifted up in this place, but you know our need. And we just pray, God, that you would heal even those needs. And now we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we will take up our offering. Oh, I forgot. We... <laughs> Never mind, we're getting there. Nice try. Good morning. So clearly you can see that spring is here, the tie-dye is out. So I have to ask, have you seen the light? Your board of trustees is working on a test project to light the stained glass to make this a much more inviting space. We will be lighting the center window. We want to know what you think. We want to know what you think. So. A benefit to this project is the breezeway. Yep, you won't be able to see the stained glass from the breezeway. You couldn't before. But we're going to put a banner. We're going to give the artist in residence an opportunity to create art that will go up over the back side of that window. But we felt that it was important that this be an inviting space, and one of the ways to do that was to light the stained glass. So if you would like to contribute to that project, please indicate a uh, lighting project in your offering. And we want to know what you think. We want to know what you think. So please, let us know. Thank you very much. And now. <laughs> 
So now our ushers will bring forth our, uh, or bring, bring up the offering. For those joining us online, you can go to our website and give by clicking our giving link. And you can also send your checks to 400 West King Street, Suite 100, Carson City, Nevada. And we thank you all for your faithfulness. Heavenly Father, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we worship and praise you today, and we thank you for your blessings upon us, and especially the love that you have shown us through your Son, Jesus. And we ask, God, that you would bless these, our tithes and our offerings, that they might be used according to your purpose and will, and that we, as your vessels, would go out into the world, loving our neighbors as ourselves, and sharing the love of Jesus with everyone we meet. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And now we will have our closing hymn. <laughs>
I am going to ask you to sit one more time. Um, today, Dave Tresher is going to come forward, and you may or may not know that General Conference begins this week, and Dave is our alternate delegate to General Conference, and he's going to give us um, some information. Good morning. Tomorrow morning, I fly to Charlotte, North Carolina, to attend the 2020 General Conference of the United Methodist Church as a reserve delegate for our California Nevada Annual Conference. You may think I erred in calling it the 2020 General Conference, but I did not. Thanks to COVID, this will, in fact, be the 2020 General Conference. I was elected back in 2018 uh, at our annual conference session uh, as a reserve delegate. And uh, I'm the only delegate from Northern Nevada. For the last six years, our delegation has met regularly to prepare for the next two weeks. General Conference is the only body that can set official policy and speak for the international denomination. You know, we don't have a pope. It brings together lay and clergy delegates from four continents whose decisions affect how millions of United Methodists do church for years to come. Uh, about 56% of the delegates are from the United States, 32% are from Africa, 6% are from the Philippines, 4.6% are from Europe, the rest are from South Korea and other connected churches. Nearly 1,100 petitions have been submitted for consideration, including 352 since 2020. Think of the General Conference, which lasts from April 23rd to May 3rd, as a combination of the United Nations General Assembly, a U.S. Congressional session, and a time of rousing Christian worship. The main issues in this conference for us are the removal of harmful language that is still part of our Book of Discipline, freeing up our pastors to follow their conscience without fear of retribution by the church, and allowing LGBTQ pastors and laity to ascend to leadership positions throughout the denomination, not just in the Western jurisdiction, where this has been common for years. Another key issue is called regionalization which, if passed, would need to be ratified by two-thirds of congregations over the next couple of years. In addition to the challenge of creating a budget where 25% of the church has left, there's also a proposal affecting the retirement plan for our pastors. So there's lots to decide and not much time to do it. Our delegation has three clergy votes and three laity votes. As a reserve delegates, my role, delegate, my role is to attend various committees uh, and report back to the delegation what went on with the legislation in that meeting. I also expect to give our seated delegates a break from time to time on the conference floor, voting in their place as necessary. And of course, I can meet with other delegates uh, and discuss our perspective on various matters before the body. And we all get to worship with United Methodists from all over the world. That's awesome. You can read about the sessions and follow them online. Just Google the United Methodist Church General Conference for the link. And I'll report back after I return in early May. Thank you. We really do owe Dave and all of our delegates. Uh, I mean, they have, they have hung in there since uh, 2018. So uh, just pray, be, be, in, be in prayer for our general conference and just pray we can move forward as the body of Christ in a way that heals uh, the brokenness um, within our church and within our world. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for this opportunity to worship and to experience the Holy Spirit and to commune with our fellow brothers and sisters and siblings. We ask, God, that you would indeed help us to love our neighbors, regardless of who those neighbors are, as ourselves, and that we would go out into the world and proclaim the joy and wonder of Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. May the blessing of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit be with you today and always. God bless and go in peace.